Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. This week, after a year of heartbreak is transformed into an almighty success, we ask just how did Simon Yates win the Vuelta Espana? We've also got the Madrid Challenge by La Vuelta, the Copa Agostinian Bernocchi, the Ocola Slovenska, the Tour Cyclist Feminine Internacional de la Deche, a new hour record, and an update from the Race to the Rock. On Sunday, Simon Yates finished off the perfect three weeks of racing and was crowned champion of the Vuelta Espana. A really important step for the 26-year-old who has this year lost Paris Nice on the last stage by just four seconds and then completely cracked on the penultimate mountain stage of the Giro d'Italia, a race which he dominated from start almost to finish. So how exactly did he do it? Well, firstly, by keeping a bloody lid on it, at least most of the time. All right, Simon, <laughs> what happened today? You were meant to keep uh, a lid on I it. I don't know. Just, yeah. You just rode away from everyone. I'm going to be trying to do a conservative, but it's just... It's not working. That video from Jack Hay coming after stage four, when contrary to team orders, Yates couldn't help but attack, taking close to half a minute on most of his rivals. Why was it against the plan? Well, because he and his team had learnt the lessons from the Giro, where he'd attacked at every possible moment to take time and bonus seconds. That, though, was the strategy that he had to adopt at the Giro, up against two strong time trialists. But without that type of rider at the Vuelta, he could afford to play the waiting game, not lose any time, but also not go too deep in trying to gain it. Speaking of which, even in the second and third weeks, it looked as though he was consciously trying to avoid going too deep. So, for example, on stage 13 to La Camperona, he lost a handful of seconds to Nara Quintana of Movistar, and then did the same thing on stage 17, but this time to Alejandro Valverde. Now, they were both very steep finishes, and you do wonder, given how good he proved to be in the final few days, if that was a deliberate move. A calculated loss of time, which meant he didn't go too deep, didn't dig too far into his reserves. Another masterstroke from Mitchelton Scott was to keep Adam Yates fresh until the final seven days of racing. The Vuelta hadn't originally been on his race program, but with Simon clearly in great form on the run up to it, he was persuaded to come along. And we didn't see anything of him until it mattered. So here are his list of stage placings for the opening two weeks of the race. And then here are his results from the final week. It was another calculated risk. However, with the likes of Jack Hay, Damien Housen, and indeed the rest of the team, they were able to guide Simon through those first two weeks, leaving Adam to come into his own when it most mattered. Whilst he held back as much as he could, he also couldn't help but attack. Along with that aforementioned unplanned stage four attack, he also put in a devastating one on stage 19 into Andorra, a show of dominance that pretty much spelt the end for his closest challenger at the time, Alejandro Valverde. On that stage, Pino won, but Yates won the race. Again though, the following day, when Adam Yates was on his last legs, Simon bridged with Mass to a move by Lopez and Quintana, knowing full well that Enrico Mass and Miguel Angel Lopez would be just as interested in riding hard as he would. Attack can sometimes be the best form of defence, but that move showed maturity beyond his years and a clarity of mind. It was the move that effectively sealed the deal in his first Grand Tour win, and Mitchell and Scott have even coined a name for these tactics. Conservative flair, no less. Very posh indeed. At the end of the day, though, you have to say that Simon Yates was the strongest rider in the race. Yes, his tactics and those of his team were fantastic. Yes, he played things out to perfection over the three weeks, but he also had the legs. Which is contrary to Movistar, whose team leaders weren't able to finish off the work that was put in by their teammates. Simon Yates could. He was the strongest, the most consistent. He didn't have a bad day, and those are all the qualities that you need to win a Grand Tour. And so, this week's Rider of the Week here at GCN has to be... Simon Yates, congratulations to you. Uh, the final podium was one of the youngest though that we have seen in decades. Yates is just 26 himself. Enric Mas, the revelation of the race, came second at just 23 years of age, whilst Miguel Angel Lopez backed up his third at the Giro with the same placing here, at just 24. Now, given the relative disappointment of Naira Quintana and Alejandro Valverde, it certainly looks like a bit of a generational shift. Well done too to Elia Viviani, who took his third stage win on the final day of racing, to Valverde, who won the point and who now has taken 100 individual top 10s on Vuelta stages, to De Gent for lighting things up almost every single day and taking the mountains jersey in the process, and to Movistar, who will be disappointed with their GC results in the end, but still managed to take the team's classification by over three quarters of an hour. 
Talking of generational shifts, we saw the end of a glittering career at the Madrid Challenge by La Vuelta. Georgia Bronzini gave a lesson to us all on how to go out in style by winning her final race as a professional rider. She formed part of a 16-woman group that stayed clear to the finish and then timed her sprint perfectly to come round Sarah Roy of Mitchelton Scott. Bronzini, who won back-to-back -back world championships in 2010 and 2011, will now hang up her wheels to become a sports director at the newly formed Trek Factory Racing. Uh, it's like uh, the, ch the chairs on the, on the big cake, a really big cake, because I can say that my career was amazing. Uh, if I can sign again, for do the same, I, I don't think anymore that wh what I have done, so I'm really, really happy. The overall race in the two days was won by Ellen van Dyke. Her team Sunweb put in a dominant performance on the opening day's team time trial and in being a part of that lead group with Bronzini, she took the win by 11 seconds from her teammate Corinne Rivera. The Coppa Agostoni down in the Lombardy region kicked off a busy period of one day races in Italy. Uh, the race was dominated by Gianni Moscon of Team Sky. That was his first race back after being thrown off the Tour de France and his subsequent five week ban from competition. He easily outsprinted Ryan Tarame at the end of the 200 km race. The following day though at the Coppa Bonocchi we had a bunch sprint and a sterling lead out from Bari Merida which saw Colbrelli perfectly delivered to the 200 meters to go mark and when he kicked nobody could even get close. Manuela Belletti and Paolo Simeon routed out an all-Italian podium, which was quite apt for the 100th edition of the race. Meanwhile, a number of riders were using the Okola Slovenska for their final preparation for the upcoming World Championships, and from that point of view, things are looking pretty rosy for the man of the moment, Julian Alaphilippe. He and his team Quickstep Floors dominated the race, taking the prologue with Bob Jungles, Stage 1 and the overall GC with Alaphilippe, and the final stage in a sprint with Fabio Jakobsen. For those of you keeping count, that means Quickstep Floors have now won 67 races this season with 13 different riders. On the other hand, many of the top female pros have been honing their form for the World Championships at the race with one of the longest names in pro cycling, the Tour Cycliste Feminin Internationale de la Deche. A double day on day one saw Alexis Ryan get the better of Arlenis Sierra on the first stage, but the tables were turned that afternoon on stage two. The big shake-up on the GC, though, came on the mountaintop finish up Mont Ventoux on day four. Second place for Margarita Garcia behind her teammate Elda Marino was enough for her to take the race lead over Katia Nuvia Doma. However, Nuvia Doma turned the tables herself the following day, taking the stage win and indeed the race lead in the process. Uh, that race will conclude on Tuesday after two more hilly stages. We also, this week, saw a new World Hour record set over in Aguascalientes in Mexico. Victoria Bussi did it the hard way too, as she'd failed twice over the past year, but perseverance paid off as she bettered the mark of Evelyn Stevens by just 27 metres, riding just over 48 kilometres in that hour. Now she's a woman of many talents because Bussi also has competed in cross country, triathlon, and holds a PhD in pure mathematics, which she got at Oxford University. And now she can add a world record to her long list achievement, inspiring stuff. And sticking with inspiring feet, it's time to head down under for the race to the rock. On Saturday, Sarah Hammond reached the rock and therefore the finish line after a tough slog along the Mulga Park Road against a fierce headwind. Such was her dominance, in fact, that as we record this, we're still waiting to see who will finish second between Nick Scarajou, riding a single speed no less, and Erin Klein. As much as the results though, this race and event is all about achievement and accomplishment over some of the toughest terrain and some of the toughest conditions in which you can ride a bike. I tip my hat to every single one of the people that competed there. Definitely not something that I would ever have the mental or physical capacity to do myself. Hammond averaged over 240 kilometers per day over that terrain in an event so tough that no man has ever managed to win it. Well done to you, Sarah. Okay, that is all for this week's GCN Racing News Show. Slightly quieter one next week, but the Italian season continues with the Giro della Toscana, the Coppa Sabatini, the Memorial Marco Pantani, and the Trofeo Matteotti. And you will be able to see highlights of all of those races over on our GCN Cycling Facebook page. Don't forget that if you can't get enough of your racing, you can now purchase a subscription to the Eurosport player by heading over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. And if you do do that, you will receive a five pound or five euro voucher to spend on GCN merchandise. Uh, there's a link to that on the screen right now. Give this video a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it. And once you've done that, why not head over to see if cycling affects men's sexual health? Cy so went in depth on that very subject in a video that you can find just down here.